Hey everybody, just in case you're a little puzzled by this video, this is my second channel. I created this channel years ago to post vlogs and personal stuff that just amuses me. You probably forgot that you even subscribed to this channel. But since 2016, I've posted only one video a year, my top 10 favorite movies of the year. And I do this just because I love movies and I see most of the new movies when they're released. And of course, I watch a bunch of them on streaming. As of today, I've seen 187 films this year. And if none of this interests you, there's no need to leave a comment. I'll see you over on my main channel woodworking for mere mortals. All of the films on my list were released in 2018, although some might have had a limited release in film festivals and screenings in 2017. I whittled down my list to 12 movies and I really struggled with which two to remove. I kept going back and forth on whether or not to include these two. So really these are sort of a 10A and a 10B. Of course that begs the question, why not just make a top 12 list? Well, because that's just not the way the world works. I'm pretty sure YouTube would collapse if I made a top 12 list. <laughs> I, Tanya was released way back in early January and was a great way to start 2018. Bargo Robbie was amazing as Tanya Harding and the visual effects were incredible. For those of you old enough to remember the Nancy Kerrigan, Tanya Harding ice skating scandal, you may expect a tabloid style movie about the trashy Tanya that you thought you knew from all of the salacious news media at the time. But after all these years, what emerges is a surprisingly heartbreaking story about a girl growing up in poverty with an overbearing mother in an abusive environment. Tanya Harding overcame a lot of obstacles to become really one of history's most talented athletes. She really never deserved any of the public trashing and the humiliation that she received and it was really inspiring to see her real story actually get told. Wes Anderson has one of the most visually recognizable directing styles today. Every shot is composed with symmetry and style. The pacing is fun and weird. Isle of Dogs, or I Love Dogs, tells of a dystopian future where a canine virus has ravaged Japan and all the dogs are banished to Trash Island. A boy named Atari sets off to find and rescue his dog, Spots. It's an odyssey and an adventure unlike anything you've ever seen. I love the quiet, low-key acting and the heartwarming story. If you love dogs and you love really cool stop motion animation, you'll also love I Love Dogs. Okay, now let's get to my actual top 10 list. Paul Schrader has a long history of directing films that explore people's inner demons and very dark themes. I remember him best from 80s films such as Cat People, American Gigolo, and the really disturbing hardcore with George C. Scott. And he's probably best known for writing Taxi Driver. At 72, Schrader has directed probably his most intimate film, First Reformed, and this is the best performance from Ethan Hawke since Boyhood. In First Reformed, he plays is a troubled minister of a small church with virtually no congregation that exists mainly for the building's historical significance and that it has a gift shop. He reaches a conflict of faith as he struggles with his own beliefs in what he perceives as a world of increasing pain and destruction. The ending is sudden, powerful, and will leave you in awe. It really took me a while to process First Reformed. This is an odd thing. I've been going back and forth whether I love this movie or not. On my first viewing, I really loved You Were Never Really Here. Then I read the book and I loved it more. Then I watched the movie a second time and I didn't love it. Then I rewatched parts of the movie and thought about what was happening, but Seriously, I was spending a lot of time thinking about this movie. So clearly it made an impact on me. It has flaws in telling a clear narrative, but maybe that's not the point. Joaquin Phoenix plays Joe, a deeply troubled war vet who is highly skilled at finding lost people and taking care of private business that law enforcement won't. He's hired by a senator to track down his 13-year-old daughter who's been kidnapped by some very bad people. No matter how careful Joe is and Joaquin Phoenix just commands every scene that he's in, he might be getting involved in a conspiracy way deeper than his cunning and brute force can handle. 
Okay, Jason Bateman has become one of my favorite actors. If you haven't seen him in Ozark, by the way, check it out. It's one of the best TV shows since Breaking Bad. In Game Night, he plays a guy obsessed with board games and he and his wife and two other couples meet every week for a game night. Eventually, they host a murder mystery party only to discover that it might be a little more real than they expected or maybe that's part of the game. This turned out to be one of the funniest comedies of the year. Great chemistry from the entire cast and scenes that had me rolling with laughter. It also features a delightfully creepy next door neighbor who is a cop played by Jesse Plemons, who you might remember as the equally creepy Todd in Breaking Bad. There's lots of fun twists and turns in this movie right up to the very end. Well, John Krasinski sure has come a long way since playing Jim on The Office. His directorial debut, A Quiet Place, just blew me away. The story takes place in a dystopian future where alien monsters kill anything that they can hear. The premise is really compelling. How would you survive in a world where even the slightest sound would result in instant death? And now imagine that your wife is pregnant. A Quiet Place is filled with lots of these what would I do situations to ponder and what results is an absolute heart pounding thriller. This was one of the quietest immersive experiences I think I've ever had in a movie theater. It was weird because nobody in the audience was making a sound. Even the slightest candy wrapper became amplified. Okay, okay, Pie Whack, it probably has no business being on anybody's top 10 list, but for some reason, I just love this movie. It's a quiet, slow-burned horror movie, but at no time does it feel like it's boring. The intensity just slowly ramps up through the entire movie to a tragic conclusion. And I'm really happy that the filmmakers decided to just go for it with this ending rather than do some sort of a feel-good cop-out. The story is simple. There's an angsty teen named Lee who gets angry with her mother and wishes she were dead. Only in this scenario, she actually performs a ritual to summon a demon named Piwacket to do the deed. And of course, immediately after performing this ritual, Lee has second thoughts and realizes that this probably wasn't the best decision she's made in life. And so then she wants to know if she can undo the curse. Nicole Munoz plays Lee with just the right amount of inner turmoil and conflicted emotions. Lori Holden, who you might remember as Andrea in The Walking Dead, plays her mother who is also going through a rough time dealing with the death of her husband, Lee's father. If you love low budget indie horror, this is a good one. Another awesome directorial debut. That's kind of a theme this year. Directed by Corey Finley, Thoroughbreds is a sort of crime thriller, suspense, dark comedy. It's one of those films that just kind of sits in its own weird reality that has you scratching your head for the first 30 minutes trying to figure out what it's all about. A couple of wealthy teens hatch a scheme to murder one of the girl's stepfather. Lily, played by Anya Taylor-Joy, is emotional but composed, while her friend Amanda, played by Olivia Cook, literally has no emotions. There's actually a great scene where she teaches Lily the method, how to shred tears on command. So the two girls hire a local drug dealer, played by Anton Yelchin. This is his final role before his untimely death to help them with their murder scheme. Thoroughbreds has a lot of funny twists that will perplex you and make you laugh, even though you might feel a little weird about laughing at really bad things. There's a really snappy dialogue and the soundtrack is just fantastically weird and it's got a great ending. Check out Thoroughbreds if you're looking for something really different. Ever since a remake of Dario Argento's 1977 giallo horror classic was announced, everyone in the horror community was a little leery, but wow, this is how you remake a movie. This film takes the story of a coven of witches in a dance studio to a new level. There are some really dark moments and brutal moments that will just take your breath away. I love the concept of dance being a sacred ritual that can be both beautiful, but also summon evil. Suspiria takes place during the Cold War and uses dance to explore themes of guilt and redemption while telling a dark tale of a power struggle between the witch mothers of the Dance Academy. The great music by Tom York of Radiohead weaves a feeling of melancholy and uneasiness. Suspiria is a breathtaking cinematic experience. An Iraq war vet suffering from PTSD and his daughter have been living in a state park in Oregon for years, completely off the grid in a 
seemingly idyllic situation. They make their own shelter, find and grow their own food. Once a month, they head into Portland to pick up his check from the VA. Buy a few groceries and supplies. Will teaches his daughter, Tom, not only how to survive, but he homeschools her as well. In fact, she's ahead of her age academically. One day, their existence comes crashing down when authorities remove them from illegally camping in the public forest. The two are briefly separated, then reunited under this pilot program to house homeless families. But is this what's best for them? Is it right to upend the lives of healthy, happy people just because they choose to live in a way that society deems unfit? Leave No Trace raises a lot of questions. There are no villains in this story and there are no simple answers. What does it mean to be homeless? Tom and her father never for a moment thought of themselves as homeless. They asked nothing from anyone, but other people felt the need to help. Thomas and McKenzie and Ben Foster give two of the most powerful performances of 2018, but I kind of think this film is going to be overlooked when it comes to awards. It's a small, intimate film that will probably leave you in tears at the end and feeling very conflicted. It's one of the most powerfully emotional films of the year. And as an aside, can I just say that it's refreshing to see a movie that portrays a strong father and child relationship. Hereditary is one of the best mainstream horror films in a long time. It creates a creepy, oppressive atmosphere from the very beginning and it never lets up. It's pretty hard to describe this movie without spoilers and it's best knowing as little as possible before experiencing it. In brief, Annie's mother passes away and causes the entire family to reflect on their relationships. Her husband, son, and daughter all deal with loss in their own ways, but it becomes clear that there might be some evil afoot. And that's really about all I can tell you because an utterly horrific, shocking, and graphic event happens that changes everything. Sure, this is a horror story, but it's also a tale of loss and grief and how people try to pick up the pieces of their lives when unspeakable tragedy occurs. Hereditary will freak you out. I really didn't have to think about what movie to put on the top of this year's list. As soon as I walked out of the theater, I knew 8th grade would be pretty hard to top. This is another directorial debut, this time from one of my favorite stand-up comedians, Bo Burnham, who has made one of the most emotionally honest films in a long time. 8th grade stars Elsie Fisher as Kayla, who's an awkward, introverted middle schooler who lives life like most kids through her phone. She vlogs on YouTube about positivity and self-esteem, something that she actually has very little of herself. This is the best, most amazingly vulnerable performance of the year, and Elsie Fisher deserves an Oscar. Bo Burnham started out on YouTube himself, and he understands its culture, and he's young enough to understand how kids are using social media. For once, this is a movie that gets this stuff right. We tend to experience life through filtered realities. We curate an image of ourselves that we want people to think we are. Our online lives are highly cultivated and our social worth is judged by numbers of followers. And for kids Kayla's age, this is all they've ever known. Eighth grade is also very difficult to watch. There are scenes that are so painful, you'll just want to jump into the screen and straighten them out. There are moments that are so awkward, you'll just want to step in and tell Kayla that, hey, real life gets way better than middle school. You'll see kids behaving exactly like real kids and you want to intervene. Eighth grade is that real. There's a scene in a car that will have your stomach in knots and a scene with Kayla and her dad around a campfire that'll probably make you cry. All that said, there's still plenty of wry humor and wit. Bo Burnham has made an almost perfect film. I hope you enjoyed this year's list and I'll see you again in 12 months, I guess, unless I find something else to post here. Thanks for watching.